Thank you very much. Um, so today I just want to focus a little bit on some of the nuances of how the radiographs are obtained and touch a little bit um, on what we kind of talked about with the complications as well. So um, whether you're getting the good standard x-rays in your office or doing them under the mini C arm in the operating room, um, it's important to always kind of make sure you maintain the appropriate angles. We'll discuss some of the angles that we look at um, when we're assessing whether or not this is a, an operative fracture or not, uh, and then lastly, um, cover the indications. So for me, we, we obviously obtain the standard PA oblique and lateral films. If it's a younger patient and I have any concern whatsoever for the SL ligament or for the scaphoid, <clears throat> we'll obtain the grip views and the ulnar deviation. So uh, it's important to remember, so you want the arm abducted up to 90 degrees, uh, the forearm should be in neutral, and the elbow should be flexed 90 degrees. So uh, ensuring that your techs are obtaining these in the appropriate fashion is important. Likewise, with your standard lateral, the arm should be adducted to the side uh, with the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, and again, the wrist in neutral. So this is, for me, especially with the PA, to ensure that I have a true zero rotation film, that's how I can assess my, uh, basically, my ulnar variance and everything else from that. Um, with the ulnar deviation, again, you want slight wrist extension with that and as much deviation as you can get. Uh, we all know that scaphoid fractures uh, can occur and up to roughly 10 to 15 percent of these fractures. Uh, for me, the grip view, so again, I like to have both hands on the film. So again, I can compare whether they just have uh, a somewhat widened SL interval uh, that they've had from, uh, from infancy uh, that's present on both sides. So my post-operative patients, when they come back to the office, um, again, to get the anatomic tilt x-rays, um, I, I want a, kind of a true PA and a true lateral. Uh, so Gelberman and Lou Galula uh, published this a while ago. Um, so again, you want the 11 degree tilt on your volar film so that, again, we see nicely down the joint to ensure that there's no screw penetration. And likewise, uh, on the lateral. So several studies have been done to show that you can just take your contralateral fist uh, and place that underneath your wrist, and that should give you roughly 23 degrees as a simple way of doing it. So again here, so on the left side, you see kind of a standard film. This is from Gelberman's article in which you see a distal plate, or sorry, a dorsal plate that looks distal and almost in the joint on the standard view, whereas once you shoot down the joint at 11 degrees, you can see nicely down the joint. Likewise, with your standard lateral, it's hard to see whether or not your screws are penetrating. So... Uh, this is a patient I did a, a distal radius osteotomy on. Um, so again, having that tilt just shows you cur your curvature very nicely uh, to ensure that there's no penetration. So some of the radiographic measurements that we standardly know. So looking at your inclination, again, you're going to drop a line down the long axis, draw a line perp perpendicular to that, um, and then from your radial styloid to the ulnar aspect. So standardly, this should be about 23 degrees. So in some patients, obviously, you can see that with this patient, uh, they've lost the majority of their radial tilt. So in this patient, it's only about five degrees. Obviously, there's numerous studies to argue as to how much a patient can tolerate. For me, uh, typically, I think of anything less than 10 degrees as being something that would be operative. Um, again, we, we think of this because when they have that radial deviation, they're going to have this uh, appearance to their hand, where basically the hand almost looks shifted over. Uh, and some of the elderly patients that, uh, you know, I think that your limitations are, are less in terms of treating them non-operatively. Um, it's important to advise them that they will have this appearance to their hand. For ulnar variants, again, you're going to draw lines uh, that are tangential to the surfaces, so of the ulnar head and the ulnar aspect of the distal radius. So most patients, it should be about zero millimeters, so plus or minus two millimeters is usually a standard I go off of. Um, so again, with this patient, uh, when, in drawing these lines, we can see there's about 5.5 millimeters of prominence of the ulnar head. So this is going to lead to, obviously, ulnar abutment in this patient. Um, and again, when we look at the appearance of their wrist, you can see how prominent uh, that ulnar styloid is. Um, so again, for me, uh, usually anything above 2 millimeters uh, is going to kind of push me a bit more towards operative. And obviously, 4 to 6 millimeters is definitely going to be something that's going to cause them symptoms.
And whether you treat that patient non-operatively and go back and do a DARA um, is something you can talk about with the patient as well. Lastly, with uh, the VOR tilt, again, drawing line, a line down the long axis, a line perpendicular to that, uh, and then measuring your VOR tilt. So in most patients, uh, the standardly is 11 degrees. And again, uh, this is something that's obviously hotly debated in terms of how much you can accept. Um, so in this patient, obviously, drawing those same lines, we see about 45 degrees of dorsal tilt. Um, some of the condom, uh, uh, common guidelines would be about 10 degrees of dorsal tilt and 20 degrees of volar tilt. Um, as you kind of get above those, you start to develop mid-carpal instability as they start to break through the mid-carpal joint rather than bending through their wrist. Um, you're also going to have some loss of their pronation and supination. And with the intraarticular step-off, uh, again, our goal is about less than two millimeters. Uh, the classic article by Jesse Jupiter demonstrated that greater than two millimeters led to roughly 91% of degenerative joint disease uh, at about seven-year follow-up. Um, Again, just because they have that degeneration doesn't necessarily mean that they'll, that they'll be symptomatic. So it's important to remember. So some use the LaFontaine criteria. So again, having more than three of these, so more than 20 degrees dorsal angulation, um, having an, an ulna fracture or something else to lead to instability, all of these are going to push you more towards operative treatment of your patient. Uh, the AOS guidelines, which is a moderate um, Recommendation is greater than three millimeters of shortening, greater than 10 degrees of dorsal tilt, uh, and an intraarticular step off of more than two millimeters. Interestingly enough, one of the only other guidelines is that they actually recommend vitamin C to try and prevent CRPS. Um, when we talk about different types of fractures, we've all seen the Collies fracture, some axial loading fractures, um, but one to kind of remember uh, is when you have a patient that comes in with kind of a volar lunate facet fracture. So this is important because not only is it something that needs to be fixed, you also have subluxation of your entire joint because your volar carpal ligaments are attached here. So your whole proximal row is going with that fracture. So I think using typically a fragment-specific plate or something to fix that facet rather than your standard plate is important to keep in mind. Um, lastly, there are also avulsion fractures. Um, important for, I try and tell my residents that somewhat counterintuitive, but again, to reduce these in the emergency room for the temporizing splinting, uh, you want to flex these patients to kind of roll back the scaphoid to get it back into the fossa. Um, if you're going to fix these, I think something like this typically would require something more like a spanning dorsal plate or an X-fix. Um, and lastly, just uh, trying to remember that, you know, while there's not always something obvious, uh, it's important to look for your dive punch fractures as well to look for that step off. Uh, and lastly, interoperative assessment. So we look at where our screws are, uh, whether they're in the DRUJ, whether they're in the joint, and kind of the overall length. Uh, so as uh, mentioned previously, so Dr. Wall's um, paper looked at kind of the strength and integrity of different screw conformations and different types of screws. Um, and so their recommendation from this was just as we talked about, is 75% of the length so that you're guaranteeing yourself not to have prominent screws. Um, so again, in looking at your different films, so for me, I want a true PA to look down the DRUJ, make sure they don't have screws in the joint. Um, again, I, I do a, a shot with slight tilt to my x-ray so I can look down the joint as well, of the radiocarpal joint, um, and then overall my plate alignment. Obviously, this could be a few millimeters more ulnar, um, but just to make sure you're aligned. On my lateral film, again, I use a 23-degree inclination film to make sure I see the joint nicely and that my screws are just subchondral. Um, you want to drop a plumb line from this to make sure that you're not prominent, you're not, that you're not past the critical line or the watershed line that's going to lead to fraying and impingement and possible tendon rupture. And then some of the different shots that we talked about. So one paper looked at, so getting lateral films uh, compared to the dorsal tangential that we just talked about. Um, so again, this gives you a nice view to make sure your screw is not in the, the third dorsal compartment. Um, and Trying to obtain this shot, you can't have the x-ray machine underneath the table. It has to be above the table. Um, it's probably easier with a larger C-arm. Uh, but with doing it with a mini C-arm, it is a bit cumbersome. Um, this is from one of my cases. And so you're, you are able to see kind of the dorsal cortex nicely. Uh, so they talk about doing the 45 degree supination, which shows you whether or not your radial styloid screws are prominent, as you can see there. Uh, and the 45 degree pronation to make sure that your ulnar sided screws aren't prominent. So again, just want to talk a little bit about the different x-rays we get, both in the 
clinic as well as in the operating room, some of the indications for surgery and then kind of different ways to treat that. Thank you.